Dear Lord, as we open your holy word, Father, I pray that you would anoint my lips with the altar of heaven, that I may speak to your people. And Father, I pray that you would be with all of us. Let us hear the truth. Let us understand the truth. And Father, let your Holy Spirit make this possible. Let him give us a true understanding of the Bible this evening. And Father, show us the path you would have us to take and help our hearts to be willing. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, Beauty and the Beast. There's a story of a boy who lived in ancient Greece. And this young man wanted to know the truth. And so he approached a sage, one of the old men of the country. And he asked this man, how can I know the truth? I want to know the truth. And so this boy followed this man. This man walked through the city without saying a word. And he led this boy to a ocean, more like a lake. And as they got into the lake, the man told the boy to put his hands on his head. And so the boy put his hands on his head and the man proceeded to take the boy's head and dunk him in on, under the water, slam his head under the water. <clears throat> the boy was shocked. He said, how dare you do this? What are you doing? And as soon as his head came out of the water, the old man took his head and threw it under the water again. The boy was gasping for air. The old man did it again. He did it three times. The boy could barely breathe. And so the boy says, how is this supposed to help me know the truth? And this is what the old man said, and it's very wise, and we can learn a lot from this. The old man told the boy, you remember how you were gasping for air, as if you were gasping for your life. If you want to know the truth, you will want the truth just as you wanted your life just now as you were gasping. And so we can learn a lot from that old man's wisdom. It's not that the truth is hard to find, but it's sometimes our hearts are not willing to know the truth. We don't have a sincere desire. We don't yearn for the truth. And I believe God wants to reveal the truth to us if we have a sincere desire to know and obey the truth, almost as if we're gasping for air. And friends, my prayer for you is that you want the truth because the Bible says the truth will set you free. And so tonight, friends, we're going to go to God's Word. And God promised if we are seeking after Him, if we desire to know the truth, that we will find it. Jeremiah says, And you shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all of your hearts. All of your heart means we want to give everything to God. We want to obey Him fully. And today, it can be hard to know the truth. In fact, there's many churches claiming to have the truth. It seems there's a church on every street corner. And all these churches, most of them anyway, they claim to be teaching from the Bible. They say, we have the Bible, we have the truth. But many of their beliefs are conflicting, they're different. And so, how can sincere, honest Christians who are desiring to know the truth how can they be sure what is the truth? Well, the Bible tells us that there's one truth and there's one true church. The book of Colossians, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Speaking of Jesus, he's the head of the body, which is the church. And the Bible goes on and says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And so not only is Christ the head of the body, which is the church, but he is calling his people to be united into one church. That's his desire. It was never God's desire to have so many divisions. That wasn't God's desire. In fact, the prayer of Jesus reads like this that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus' prayer, Jesus' desire, was that his people would be united, would be one. And so why is it that we have churches all over 
many teaching different things, all claiming to know the truth, and why this division? Well, friends, the Bible predicted that there would be division in the church, and it even told us how it would happen. Let us read. It says, Take heed there unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So the Bible warned that wolves, in fact, the Bible elsewhere says they'd be like wolves in sheep's clothing that would come into God's church and would deceive the flock, God's people. Also of your own self shall men arise, even Christian men, the Bible predicted, men claiming to be of God, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And so the Bible predicted that there would be divisions arising from false teachers. And this is exactly what happened as we look through the annals of history. We have different false teachers and false doctrines became to be brought into the church. And so we can see evidence that the Bible was true in its warning. But as we head to the book of Revelation, God's last day message for his people, this book casts light on what the true church and the false church really is. In fact, Revelation depicts God's true church in the last day as a woman, a woman clothed in white, a pure woman. But it also represents the false church as a harlot woman. And so the Bible gives clear symbolism as to the characteristics of each of these churches. And we're going to analyze, we're going to study these churches this evening. And we want to be sure what the Bible refers to a church as, what the Bible uses to symbolize a church. And we read this, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Okay, so the Bible's talking about husbands and wives. Now look at, look at the parallel the Bible makes. This is a great mystery. This is the next verse. But I speak concerning Christ and his church. And so the Bible is making a parallel between husbands and wives and Christ and his church. And you'll see throughout Revelation that God refers to his church as a woman and also a false church, a counterfeit church, as an apostate or a harlot's woman. So let us consider this true church. After all, this is the church that we want to be a part of. This is the church that God is calling his people to be part. And so this pure woman is described in the book of Revelation. And we read, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried out, travailing in birth, and pains to be delivered. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so we see that this woman is, is pictured as standing on the moon, and she has um, these stars around her head. And we also see the symbolism of the dragon is after her. The dragon is, is seeking to attack and devour her. And so this is the symbolism given. Now, what does this mean? Well, we can continue to read. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, friends, who is the man-child that would rule all nations with a rod of iron? We know that's Christ. We can go to multiple verses to prove that, but I want to get right to our point this evening. So we can uh, conclude, we can agree that this is Jesus this man-child. And so this woman is, is, um, is shown, is represented as a woman being God's church. And God's church would give birth to Jesus. Jesus came through the line of David. All right. And so yes, Mary, God used Mary to give birth to Jesus. And so this man-child would come forth. But the Bible warns that this dragon would try to destroy the child. And sure enough, Satan, representing the dragon, 
worked through pagan Rome to try to devour or destroy this man-child. Um, you know the story, King Herod put out a decree that all children two years and old, uh, two years and younger, would be destroyed. Um, but of course, Jesus was preserved. God protected him. But the devil did not give up on his attacks. He was relentless. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And he repeatedly tried to get Jesus to trip and fall and rebel against God. Even until his death, the devil was constantly harassing our Savior. And he and, um, encouraged the Jewish crowd to crucify and kill the Messiah. And so the devil continued to attack Jesus, but he was not victorious because Jesus overcame sin. He overcame death and he rose up from the grave victorious and death could not hold him down. He conquered the grave. And so the devil became a defeated foe. And as Jesus resurrected from the tomb and ascended to heaven, the devil did not give up on his attack. As, he, as a defeated foe, he knew that he had but a short time. And so, and so he had turned his attention to the people of God. He could not destroy the Savior, so he had turned his attention to God's people. And he used techniques um, such as uh, trying to kill, trying to destroy and intimidate. The amphitheaters, Christians were fed to the lions. Uh, I don't know if you can see in the picture, but uh, Christians were used as human torches. All right, this was entertainment to see the Christians burned, killed, and destroyed in Rome. So the devil's fury was, was raging against God's people. But he saw that as God's people were persecuted, he saw that they had faith. They had trust in their Savior. They had a peace in their, in their faces. Oftentimes, the martyrs, people who would be killed for their faith, they would sing hymns. And all the other people who were watching the persecution, their hearts would be turned to Christianity. They would say, I want what these people have. They have hope, they have faith. And so the devil realized that his tactics of, of attacking and brutalizing God's people were not working. It was almost as if their blood was seed that water Christianity. And so the devil changed his techniques. He said, if I can't beat them, I should what? Join them. That's a phrase we use in the US. If you can't beat them, join them. And so the devil used this strategy and he actually began to infiltrate the church. He infiltrated the church. And so what he did through the Emperor Constantine and several other church leaders through the years is he began to bring in false pagan teachings into the church. One of the most notable was Sunday sacredness, a day that God had never made holy. But Emperor Constantine knew that many people in his kingdom worshiped the sun god whose name was Ra. And so to get people to get more converts into the church, um, he adopted this pagan holiday of sun worship. It was a gradual process, but eventually this day um, became recognized as the Christian Sabbath. Many other things, such as the immortality of the soul, um, began to come into the church. And so the pagan Roman Empire made a smooth transition into the papal Roman Empire or the Catholic Church. And historians are quick to admit, admit this fact. In fact, we can read the new Christians were as far from thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. And so again, we see that the new Christians were simply baptized pagans. It was a convenience. Now Christianity was, it was convenient to have that as the official religion of the Roman Empire. But friends, Christians, there were many Christians who despite the persecution, despite the error and the falsehood that crept into the church, they remained faithful to God. They were faithful. They were few, but they were faithful. And so the Bible tells that the, that the devil, Satan, was relentless. He continued his attack against God's church. 
And we read that the dragon persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Remember, the woman is God's church. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Okay, now the wilderness in the Bible, wilderness represents a barren land, okay, an unpopulated area. And so we can see that the woman, God's church, would flee from the persecution that was happening in Europe, and they would go to the wilderness, and that God would feed or protect her for 1,203 score days. But we also know that that was a period of persecution by the papal church. And this is a review. We've learned about this in our last two messages. But the papal church gained her supremacy in 538 AD. This is when the church uprooted the last of the three kingdoms that were opposed to her rule. Okay, those kingdoms were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Okay, and in 538, um, the papal church came into full power, and they would last until 1798, when the pope, the church, would receive a deadly wound as Pope Pius VI was taken captive by the French general Berthier. Okay, and that showed that the papacy no longer um, had, had total power in Europe like they did for the last 1,000 plus years. What happened in 538, as soon as the papacy gained their power, uh, Justinian made this quote. He said that the head of the church, the true is the true and effectual corrector of heretics. And so don't miss this, friends. The church adopted a policy that is not in line with scripture. They, they adopted the policy of force and intimidation. In other words, if people did not agree with the doctrines or the teachings of the church, they were persecuted, they were killed. And in fact, the Pope, okay, also known as the Bishop of Rome, um, was in charge. He had the authority to persecute and even to kill heretics. And so what did the Christians do? They fled to the mountains. Yes, you had many groups such as the um, Albigenses, the Waldenses, okay, and many groups, they would flee to the Italian Alps and different mountains in, in Western Europe. And there in those rocky mountain abodes, they would worship God, their hymns would echo through the hills, and they would worship their Lord. They had Bibles that they would study. And sometimes they would bring small leaflets from those Bibles, they'd bring them down to the city to share God's truth. Sometimes they could get killed if they gave it to the wrong person, but they stayed faithful to God, even as they had to flee to the mountains. And as the years progressed, many Christians were martyred and killed. Here we have John Huss, a man who stood for God's truth. They were burned at the stake and called heretics. In fact, it's estimated that over 50,000, pardon me, 50 million uh, People were killed, were slaughtered during the Middle Ages over religious beliefs because they would not comply with the teachings of the Catholic Church. But God's word would prevail. God's word would stand true, friends, and God was working behind the scenes to keep his faithful people. And so he worked through inventors such as Johannes Gutenberg, who created the printing press. Now, what did the printing press do? It allowed the Word of God, the precious words of God, to be printed and distributed throughout all the land. Now, what does God's Word do when it is read and spread? It brings lights. And so the dark ages that were covered with darkness, intellectual, academic, and spiritual darkness, as God's Word spread throughout Europe, it was lightened. And you had the Renaissance, new learning and new inventions. You had the Reformation, which was a reform of the church. People began to see the teachings of the Catholic Church do not line up with the Bible. We're saved by grace, not works. We confess to Jesus, not a priest. And so they started to learn these things, and suddenly you had Protestant churches emerge. You had the great reformers, men like Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and John Huss and 
um, men like Charles Wesley and John Wesley and John Calvin. And these were men who all brought new truths, new truths to the Christian church. No, they didn't know all the truth, but, they, but God raised them up, raised them up in the Reformation to bring new truths to his church and to reform the apostate church. But unfortunately, um, many of them were persecuted and killed. But the good news is the reign of the papacy came to an end in 1798, as we have discussed. Um, this is General Berthier, uh, Napoleon's general, and he took Pope Pius VI captive. This was a deadly wound. The papacy no longer had power. They no longer had the power that they once did during the Middle Ages. And so what would happen next? The devil is still attacking and God's people are still moving forward. The great controversy between good and evil is raging. So what would be the next play in history? Well, we can see that God opened up a new land across the ocean. In fact, this land was prophesied in scripture. We'll study it on Friday. And this would be a land of freedom. It would be a nation without a king and a church without a pope. And so in this nation of freedom, the founding fathers of the United States of America vowed to give religious freedom to all their people, to allow their people to worship God according to their conscience, not according to a king or to a pope. And so now we begin to see the last day remnant church of Bible prophecy emerge. According to Revelation, after God's people travel to America, we can see chronologically that certain descriptions are given to his last day or remnant church. And so we're going to look at that, friends. We're going to uh, look at the characteristics of God's remnant, but also the harlot woman. We're going to go right to our Bibles for that. The Bible describes this harlot woman as sitting on a beast. All right. And it describes her this way. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This is the harlot woman, the false apostate church of the Bible. And this is how she's pictured, making the nations drunk, with her wine. And so I would like to put out tonight, I would like to make it clear that this woman, this harlot woman, is one in the same as the beast of Revelation 13 that we have already identified as the Antichrist. It's the same descriptions, friends. It's the same characteristics. And Bible prophecy uses a principle of repeat and expand. Okay, it'll, it'll give you a teaching, and then chapters later, it'll repeat that teaching, but with additional information. And so let us see the description of this harlot woman in Revelation 17. Um, and we're going to get there, but first I want to kind of uh, track the progress of God's church. And we'll see how the harlot and God's church collide. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, and having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. This is a description of the harlot woman, the apostate church. And she was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a cup in her hand of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so this is the description, friends. This is the solemn description of the harlot woman that God condemns, that God condemns in the last days. So let's look at her characteristics. We go on, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered, with great admiration. And so even John the Revelator had amazement. He had some form of respect for this great universal power. Now, who is this universal power? We've already identified her 
in Revelation 13. And let us recap the characteristics that we just read in Revelation 17. We saw that this woman would be guilty of committing blasphemy. Now, once again, this harlot woman is the papacy. It is the Roman Catholic Church. And again, every time I say that, I give the disclaimer. Jesus loves Catholics. We're not condemning Catholic people. We're identifying a false system that the Bible condemns, not the people within that system. I, I, I know I say that a lot, but I just want to be clear. This power would be guilty of condemning, uh, committing blasphemy. Also, they would seem to be wearing purple and red and having much gold. They would be referred to as the mother that has many daughters that have fallen. Also, they would be guilty of shedding the blood of the saints of God. They would sit on seven mountains. This, this power would sit on seven mountains. And it would be a great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, um, so let's just make sure the papacy matches all of these, because if it misses just one, it cannot be right. It has to meet each one. Okay, so guilty of committing blasphemy. Is that true? We've covered this several times. The Catholic National reveals, according to the papacy, their claim is the Pope is not only representative of Jesus Christ, but it's Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. That is blasphemy. Only God is God. All right, so a human claiming to be God is the biblical definition of blasphemy. The other biblical definition of blasphemy is claiming to forgive sins. And the papacy does this as well. The confessional booth, which is a replacement of God's plan of salvation, of confessing our sins to our high priest in heaven, which is Jesus. The confessional booth is a replacement. It's a counterfeit. And so the church claims the ability to forgive sins, which once again is blasphemy. So they meet this first point exactly. The next point we see is that the church, or this, this harlot woman, excuse me, would seem to be wearing purple and red and having much gold. Now, it's almost as like God has just wants to be so precise so that we'll have no doubt of who these powers are fulfilled by. And the church, even their main colors are red and purple. That's even their colors. It, it's so, the, the prophecy is so precise. It's so exact. All right, and also wearing much gold. No one will argue that the papacy is, uh, their wealth is beyond imagination. If you consider the years that they have accumulated um, indulgences where they have actually um, sold, um, selling, they've sold forgiveness of sins to, to God's people, okay, which is against the Bible, and all the, all the monies they've collected through the centuries, if you look at their elaborate buildings and their vast amounts of property, the wealth of this organization is, is unimaginable. And so truly, they meet the description given in Revelation. Also, and I don't, I want you to miss, I, I don't want you to miss this. Um, this is a very important point, letter C. According to the Bible, this whore of Revelation, all right, this, this scarlet woman, the Bible says would be referred to as the mother that has many daughters that have also fallen. Now I want to be very, I want to be very tactful because I believe that God has loving Christians in all churches, in Protestant churches, in Catholic churches. God has sincere, honest people that are following the light that they know. In fact, I can't say that I'm a better Christian than any of them. That's between them and God. But I do want to point out that according to the Bible, the churches that follow in the teachings of the papacy that have adopted or borrowed the same, teaching, the same false teachings as the papacy, the Bible refers to them as her daughters. Okay, as her daughters. And so it's true that the papacy, if you look at many of the churches in the Protestant Christian world, many of them have the same beliefs as the papacy. Okay, for example, the immortality of the soul. We have seen that it's not biblical. It's a pagan teaching. It's not supported by scripture. The Bible says the dead know nothing. But there's many churches that have adopted this pagan teaching, teaching that you fly directly to heaven 
or go directly to an uh, unknown place called hell in the middle of the earth somewhere. The Bible doesn't support that. It says that the dead wait in the grave until resurrection day. And so this is part of the false teachings of the papacy. Okay, Sunday sacredness. Once again, not supported in Scripture. But many churches have adopted this teaching. And so therefore, the papacy, the harlot woman, does in fact have many daughters. The next point that we read is this power would be guilty of shedding the blood of the saints of God. And this one we don't have to spend much time on. It's so clear. In fact, conservative estimates say that the papacy is guilty of killing over 50 million Christians. Okay, people that did not agree with her teachings. Also, this harlot woman is said to be sitting on seven hills. Uh, pardon me, seven mountains. Did you know, I, who knows the nickname for Rome, Italy, which is the headquarters of where the Vatican is? It's actually called the City of Seven Hills. You can Google it. I, most of you probably already know that. But Rome is the City of Seven Hills. And the Bible says that it's sitting on seven mountains. So that is the exact name that has been given uh, to this area where the papacy exists. All right, next we see point F, last point here, is that this would be a great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. A great city. And it's, we can have no doubt that Vatican City would in fact be a great city. It's the only city in the world that is also a country. Vatican is its own country. And sure enough, sure enough, the dignitaries, the world leaders from across the globe come flocking to visit the Pope to pay him homage. He's widely respected. In fact, um, several years back in the USA, you had US presidents bowing before the Pope, um, Pope John Paul II at his funeral. So this would be a great city that would gain worldwide recognition. And the Bible also says, referring to this harlot, upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Friends, God is serious about this topic of the Antichrist. There's a reason that we're sharing these truths with you, because this power receives God's final warning and condemnation. And we don't want anyone here to be affiliated with this harlot woman, this power known as Babylon. We want to give you a solemn warning so that you can avoid the the results that will happen to this power. And so Babylon, we see a name given to this harlot woman, this false church. It's called Babylon the Great. And the Bible goes on to say the punishment. Well, it goes on to say why this uh, power is guilty. And they're following another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city. Because, this is why she's fallen. Because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, so that is why Babylon is condemned. Because she has made the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Remember, fornication is unfaithfulness. This woman is a church. And so this woman has been unfaithful to God. And how is one unfaithful to God? By not following his teachings. In fact, in the Bible, Wine is used to represent teachings. And we have the pure wine, the true wine or teachings of Jesus. And we have the false wine or the false doctrines that are taught by this harlot woman. That she has actually intoxicated the world with this wine. And it goes on to say, speaking of this woman, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So even the kings of the earth, the nations of the earth have been made drunk with these false teachings. So what are these false teachings of Babylon? What is the wine of Babylon that she has been condemned for? Well, as Christians, we simply have to look at the false teachings that the Catholic Church has promoted in the past to determine what these teachings are. 
And so let us examine these now. We have the immortality of the soul, the, the teaching that the soul lives on after death. We have the false teaching that Sunday sacredness is sacred instead of God's holy Sabbath. The, the teaching of a secret rapture. Okay, we kind of covered that briefly. I think that was even in message two. But it's the teaching that Jesus will come secretly. And the Bible does not support that. In fact, this teaching gives sinners a false hope. It gives sinners a false hope that they will have a second chance after Jesus comes. But the Bible says when Jesus comes, He will gather His people. The dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive shall meet them in the air. And it says that the wicked will be slain by the brightness of His coming. All right, so there's no secret rapture. A false teaching of Babylon, the wine of Babylon, is that the Ten Commandments are no longer binding. This is the wine of Babylon. Also the teaching that eternal torment is hellfire. That hell will burn for all of eternity. The Bible teaches that God will destroy the wicked. They will be ashes under our feet. They will be destroyed. <clears throat> also the false forms of baptism. We studied baptism in these meetings and we saw that baptism is by full immersion, not by sprinkling. It's not for infants. It's full immersion for people who can make a decision to follow Jesus. Also, confession of sins to a priest. Okay, this is not biblical. This is the wine of Babylon. We're to confess our sins to Jesus alone. To God alone and Jesus. Also God, He is our intercessor. And so I want to share a quote. This is just an example of how the papacy, this harlot woman even admits to having these false teachings. For example, nowhere in the Bible do we find that Christ or the apostles ordered that the Sabbath be changed from Saturday to Sunday. We have the commandment of God given to Moses to keep holy the Sabbath day. That is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Today, most Christians keep Sunday because it has been revealed to us by the church, referring to the Roman Catholic Church, outside the Bible. And we've seen numerous quotes through this seminar of how the church openly admits to have authority above the Bible. And they claim that the mark of that authority is changing God's holy Sabbath from the Sabbath, seventh day, to Sunday, the first day. All right. And so this is the, these are the, the things that Babylon has been denounced for. Her false teachings, her wine. And the Bible even says that these teachings have deceived the nations. Much like wine causes you to be inebriated or drunk, these false teachings have deceived God's people. And they have caused many of God's people to be lost or be deceived by the evil one. And so here is the denunciation. Here is the warning that God has given to Babylon. And friends, before I read this warning, and I want to make this point very clear, is that Babylon, according to the Bible, is not simply the apostate church, which is the papacy, but it's also those who have been influenced or the churches that have adopted her teachings. Okay, the daughters of this harlot woman. The word Babylon actually means confusion. It goes back to the Tower of Babel. Okay, and it's, this, it's the idea of being confused, of not knowing God's truth. And so as we read this denunciation, this applies to the harlot woman and all the churches that have been deceived by her false teachings. The Bible says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich, through the abundance of her delicacies. And friends, don't miss this. This is the final warning given to Babylon. And it's something none of us want any part of. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, 
that ye may not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And friends, in that warning, I can hear the love in Jesus' voice. I can hear the passion. I can almost hear a tears coming through that warning. It's the most solemn warning given in Scripture, but it's filled with love. I want you to take a close look at this message that Jesus is giving to Babylon, is giving to the false church and those who have been deceived by her false teachings. Jesus calls them, and don't miss this, Jesus calls them his people. Jesus has people in Babylon. Jesus has people that love him and are following the best they know. But as they hear the truth from God's holy word, God is calling them to come out of her. God is calling them to, to separate from this harlot woman who will be destroyed because he knows that the false teachings of Babylon lead to destruction. And so Jesus is giving a message of love, but of solemn warning. And so this woman, this pure woman, God does not leave his people without a solution. He doesn't tell his people to flee from Babylon and have them wondering where to go. But God has given an ark of safety. He's given a pure woman, a pure church that he describes in Revelation. And so our attention now is turned to this pure woman of Revelation. How does the Bible describe her? Well, first of all, it says that the devil hated her. This church has a special place in God's kingdom, and therefore the devil will attack. He will attack this woman. Listen to what the Bible says. The dragon was wroth, wroth means angry, was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Don't miss this. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Friends, that's a description of God's last day people, his remnants. And so what is a remnant? I keep saying the word remnant. What do I mean by remnants? Well, I don't know if you all use this terminology here in the Philippines. Uh, just nod your head if you do. But in the States, when we have a carpet, okay, when we have a certain uh, carpet, the remnant is the leftover. The remnant is whatever is left over after that carpet has been cut up and sold. Now, something you must know about the remnant, it is the same as the original. The remnant is the same as the original. And so God's remnant people will be the same as Christ's original church that was pure, that was holy. God has a remnant. It is the remainder. And so we've seen in the previous verse that they would keep the commandments of God. They would have um, the testimony of Jesus. So we can see that God's remnant, his true church in the last days, would keep his commandments and they would have the faith of Jesus Christ. They would uplift Jesus' name. They would have trust in Jesus' power and his grace. But let us continue to, to study about God's last day remnant. One thing we know about the remnant is that they would preach God's final last day message to the world. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14, God's final warning to the world. And we read in those messages, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. It is the privilege of God's remnant last day people to preach the three angels' messages, God's final message. And this gospel of the kingdom, we know that this uh, gospel is something that the Bible prophesied would be spread to the world. Matthew tells us this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. And friends, this prophecy is being fulfilled this very night. As you are hearing this message here in Manila, Philippines, as those on YouTube, as those on Facebook are watching across the world, this three angels message is being shared throughout the globe. God's word is being fulfilled. And so we can see this last day church, God's church, would also preach the three angels messages of revelation, which we've seen in Matthew as the everlasting 
gospel. We also know that this would be a worldwide movement. It wouldn't be an isolated small movement in just a corner of the world, but this would be a worldwide movement. And we see in Revelation that this three angels message saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. So God's last day church would give glory to God. And the Bible tells us a way that we give glory to God. It says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Listen to this. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So notice from this passage, friends, that the way we can glorify God is by taking care of our bodies. Our bodies do not belong to us. They belong to God. And so God's last day people, his remnant, they would give glory to him and how they eat and how they drink and how they care for their bodies. And you can see that even in these meetings, we've had those powerful health messages at the beginning of every night practical things that you can use to improve your health and give glory to God with your body. And the Bible tells us to do that. And it describes his last day people is doing that. Also, this last day group saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And so God's last day church would preach that his judgment is here. And it's, it would preach that it is happening right before the soon return of Jesus. And so again, they would teach that God's judgment is here. And friends, as you hear these characteristics, I want you to begin to ask yourself, which church is doing all these things? And don't take my word. I'm not here to uh, push or promote anything because of my opinion. I simply want to go by God's word and I want you to be a part of God's last day church. And so I want you to ask yourselves, what church is doing all these things? All right, so let's go to number, um, the seventh point. Again, sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And so this last day movement would also lift up, would also exalt God's holy Sabbath day. The wording in Revelation is almost taken verbatim from the fourth commandment, which points to God as our creator. And so this movement would also call the world to honor God's Sabbath. Now, friends, if you do some simple math, if you do the process of elimination, you'll probably be able to eliminate 99% of the world's denominations and churches with number seven alone the fact that God's last day church will teach the Sabbath and keep all of his commandments because 99 churches are eliminated right there. And so as you study the truth, you don't have to go studying all the religions in the world like some people do to try to find the truth. You simply look at what the Bible says about God's true church and you will simply be able to eliminate all the false churches and be able to identify God's true remnant people. And so we go on. And therefore followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so this last day movement, God's true church, would also warn the world about the false teachings of Babylon. They would warn the world. They would preach against these things so that God's people would not be deceived. And friends, these are the characteristics of God's true church. And friends, I want to tell you tonight that I want to be very confident in saying this. And I don't say this because um, I belong to this church, but I have carefully examined all of these facts. And I have seen that there is one church there's one church in the world that fulfills all of these characteristics, all right? And this is not being exclusive. This is not boastful. This is simply Bible facts. As you look at these characteristics, 
God has lifted up a church as a movement of destiny. And it started in the 1800s. It started as what was known as the Advent Movement. And these were people looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And out of that movement grew a people that studied the scripture. And they started to learn about the judgment message, about the sanctuary, about God's Sabbath. And they organized and they became identified as the Seventh Day Adventist Church. All right, and I'm sure a lot of you have already um, heard that. Some of you have already been attending our church on Sabbath. But friends, this is the only organization, this is the only church that is following all of the characteristics of God's remnant people. And again, I invite you to compare the biblical characteristics. And I wouldn't tell you that if it were not true, if it were not Bible truth. Because friends, I don't want you to be deceived. I want everyone here to find God's ark of safety, to be part of his pure woman represented in Revelation as being his true church and not to be part of Babylon, a system that has been corrupted, that has been deceived with false teachings. Friends, we can see that God would not leave his people stranded. He gives very firm warnings about this harlot woman. And he says, do not be a part of her plagues. He says, come out of her, my people. But we know that God will always have a solution. He doesn't want you to, to be lost, to be stranded. So he has provided a church that is keeping his commandments and that matches the characteristics of revelation of his last day church. And we see this serious solemn warning once again, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And friends, I know many of you, many of you are very rooted in your church. And again, I want to say this. I this is, I, I don't judge any Christian, Catholic, Protestant. It's not about the individual. I believe that there's loving Christians in all churches. In fact, I've had the privilege of getting to know many of you. And I have been convinced that you love Jesus, that you are willing to go wherever he calls you to go and to follow whatever he teaches you to obey. And so this is not about an individual. But friends, this is about being safe with Jesus in these last days, of being part of his remnant people that keep his commandments and have the faith of Jesus. And so as you consider this message, I pray that you would consider the appeal of Jesus, of come, come out of her, my people. Jesus is referring to those in Babylon, to the fallen Protestant churches who have been deceived by the teachings of Babylon. He is calling them my people. And he's saying, you're my people, come out of her. I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to receive the plagues that will come upon Babylon. And friends, out of love, there's love in my heart for you. And it's my desire for you to also come out of Babylon and be part of God's last day remnant. And I believe that all of us here, God has brought to this place for a purpose. And I know that these messages have been eye-opening, um, even alarming at times to many of you. But friends, keep your eyes on Jesus because he wouldn't reveal truth to you if he wouldn't help you to follow it. And he has entrusted you with these messages and you have a solemn responsibility and privilege to walk in the light that he has given to you. And I know sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's uh, uncomfortable to follow Jesus, but it's always worth it. It's always worth it, friends. And as we reflect on tonight's message, I think of, think of Noah's Ark, because back in the Old Testament, we had an unpopular teaching. The majority of the world did not accept it, but it was the Word of God. And Noah preached for many years, 
and he was rejected by many, but he continued to preach the message. And as those faithful few, it was only eight people, only eight got on that ark, they were protected through the storm. And friends, in the last days of this earth's history, the Bible tells us that a storm greater than any has faced the earth will come. But friends, God has not left us without an ark of safety. God has offered us a protective ark for us to join in these last days, a church of like-minded believers that keep his commandments. They have the faith in Jesus. They are teaching his judgment, preaching the three angels' messages, teaching that your health and your body matters. And friends, God's last day people will be those who go through to the end. And friends, I invite you, I invite you to be a part of that group, to get in that ark of safety that God has given to each of us. And as we conclude, I want to um, just guide you through that decision card that was given to you. And if you could take out that card, and I'm just going to um, help you understand what each of the options are, and you can check whatever is appropriate that God is impressing you to check. And the first is this, it is clear to me that a remnant is an authentic continuation of the original, and that in the last days, the pure faith of Jesus is to be once again taught again. If that's clear to you, please check off that first box. The next box says, I want to follow Jesus completely and be part of his last day remnants who are described as keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And friends, I pray that everyone in this room checks that box. Because friends, that is how God's people will make it through by the faith of Jesus, which inspires and empowers them to obey his commandments. The next box reads, I would, I would like to be part of a worldwide movement that fits this prophetic description, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we have seen, friends, that there is only one church that matches all the descriptive points. And I wouldn't be part of the church if that wasn't true. It wasn't convenient for me to be a part of this church. I gave up some things, but I couldn't deny that there is one single church that clearly matches all of the Bible's descriptors. And it makes sense. It makes sense because God has called his people into one church and he has always preserved a remnant throughout history. And as we look around, we can see one church, just one, with the characteristics of that remnant. And the last box is simply, I would like more information on this subject. And if that is appropriate, if you'd like more, you can check that box. And friends, as you consider this, once again, I encourage you to put your trust in Jesus, to know that if you take a step of faith, that he will honor that. The Bible says the path of the light, the path of the, path of the righteous is as the shining light that is shining brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. And so as you walk in the light, Jesus will give you more light and your path will get brighter and brighter. But there's also a solemn warning that walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtakes you. And so it's essential as God reveals truth to you to walk in that truth. Because if we reject truth that God gives to us, darkness will overtake you. And I say that out of love because I want all of you to walk in the light and to be with me once again when Jesus returns. That's my desire, friends. And let's close with prayer. After you uh, filled out your card, please put your name and we will have our ushers simply collect those in the middle aisle. You can pass those to the end of the aisle. Dear God, we are so grateful that in the last days you have provided an ark of safety. And Father, I pray that everyone here would have the courage to walk after you. No matter what friends or families or pastors may say, Father, we must put you first because obedience to you 
is more important than anything else. And Father, I pray that you would give the precious souls in this room faith and courage to continue to walk with you. And Lord, as we hear your word, as we make a decision to obey your word, let us turn our eyes to our only hope, our only faith, and our only source of strength in these last days. And that is you, Lord. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In his name we pray, amen.